So welcome. Um, I did run a dance company in Copenhagen, Denmark for 10 years, and I, I ran a dance school called the Bid Bridging Program, which brought in uh, pre-professional adult dancers, and, and we worked with the community in developing their art practice. Um, in all of my work as an artist, as a, a dance artist, I've always been very interested in kind of breaking down the myths around dance and trying to figure out ways to make performance more user-friendly and um, easier to understand. So a lot of my work has been in pre-performance talks, post-performance talks, lecture demonstrations, opening up the creative process for open, open to public rehearsals. And so it's been a huge mission of mine to try and just crack open um, the language of dance particularly, but performing arts in general. So that's what this talk is about today. It's a, a world premiere talk, so I've been a little nervous about it because, of course, it's been something I've been working on for a couple of decades, but to consolidate it into a, a kind of a, a composed lecture, is, uh, this, is, this is a new lecture for me. So I'm going to be busy reading the room to see how you're feeling, and I have a few sort of little interactive things. I won't make you get up and dance, you know, unless you want to, then we can do that halfway. Um, so, uh, and I also jump from PowerPoint to DVD to internet to even overhead projector. So let's see how this all works. I just said to um, the videographer, if I make it out of here alive today with all these little <laughs> buttons that I have to remember, then I'll be happy. So um, I have taught in the seniors program, and, and one of the classes that I taught was called um, Coming Out of the Fog, and it was about... Um, how to come away from a performance without saying, I didn't get it. So trying to figure out ways to read performances and not just mainstream performances. So I um, based the course on quite a few field trips to um, a little more uh, edgy performances, grassroots performances in smaller spaces and um, re introduced another language and another way of speaking and reading that language with the seniors. So um, that's all wrapped into this lecture. And I, I wanted to formalize it, so I am actually reading at points. I am showing you things, and at points I'm moving a little bit. So I'm hoping that um, you don't feel separated from me when I'm, when I'm actually reading, because I felt that I wanted to get everything in. I like questions along the way opposed to questions at the end. So every once in a while I'm going to stop and I'm going to look up and see how you're doing. And if you have questions or comments, I'm happy to spread that all the way through. Okay? So, without further ado, and I think that I can actually move away from this podium, which would be nice. Just see if this works. Okay. All right, here we go. So the presentation is called Cold Art, Warm Heart, The Power of Interpretation. It's an exploration of Gao Shijiang's work as a playwright and author, particularly his term cold literature in relation to reading and interpreting performance and the body. The Refusal. Is it possible for an artist to balance authenticity, integrity, within the creative impulse without constructing a self-imposed exile, either personally or geographically? These are questions I ask as an artist who from day to day vacillates between the intentions and the consequences of remaining true to one's own impulse and yet tethered to the audience and also the funders. In my case, as a dancer, performer, I enter this inquiry remaining cognizant and, yes, even responsible to those who witness my dance pieces. It's enormously necessary to construct a whole matrix of support, sharing both emotional material and intellectual resources in the cultivation of one's own artistic community. However, despite these well-intentioned efforts, they're often met with resistance. 
There is an existing fallacy that collaboration and partnerships dilute and dissipate personal voice, <coughs> preventing the necessary networking and the cultivation of a shared spirit or quest. The silo syndrome, or the silo syndrome of protectionism, I believe, fosters a very specialized dialect within the expressive language for an artist. And the grammar of this language becomes at times impenetrable. Is the retreat of the artist sourcing deep within and mining the authenticity of voice necessary? And must it, be, must it be shared only in his or her terms? Or do we risk an audience sh shaking their heads and just saying, I don't get it? In grade 12, I was, of course, faithfully, diligently pushing against conventional discourses of any kind. I'm going to tell you a short story. It was time to archive our experience of high school, to acknowledge our memories, to mark the occasion, and by the typical method, of course, the school annual. I, of course, pushed against this ritual by taking a clean white t-shirt and permanent marker around class to class, inviting an alternative route for the farewell inscriptions. Of course, there were adolescent pontifications and existential haikus that were strategically placed in significant locations of the shirt, primarily the arena of the breast and the armpit. Yet quietly, Almost in an insignificant place, back of the left shoulder, a message from my drama teacher was written that I carried with me and which now runs through the center of my trajectory, my creative trajectory. This above all else to thine own self be true. Not an original thought, I understand. Thanks, William. My initial question is, according to whom, above all else, does this credo imply a necessary self-imposed exile as a consequence of its achievement? It seems that this is the case for the Nobel Prize winner in literature and author of Soul Mountain, Gao Shijang, who has termed his writing as an artistically political act, coined cold literature. Gao Shijang describes cold literature as a non-utilitarian sort of literature which, if fully embraced, necessitates isolation. Quote, its existence depends on writers' willingness to endure loneliness. But he also claims that to engage in cold literature is a liberating act. It is only by being an unwaveringly solitary individual without attachments to some political group or movement that the writer is able to win a thoroughgoing freedom. This is clearly an isolationist tone to his acclamation of cold literature and where he must locate himself in this term. He says, I should perhaps reaffirm that I do not belong to any school, whether in politics or in literature, and also not to any ism, which includes nationalism and patriotism. For the sake of social realist and romantic revolutionary representations, historically, the Chinese artist, his voice was muffled, stunted, and even silenced. I'll read you just one small little excerpt from this. Refusing to confirm to Mayo's, conform to Mayo's guidelines for literature, Gao had no alternative but to write in secret. His voracious reading habit and his studies at the Beijing Foreign Languages Institute, from which he graduated with a major in French literature in 1962, allowed him to develop as a writer. He was subsequently assigned work as an editor and translator at the Foreign Languages Press, and at the outbreak of the Cultural Revolution, he burned a suitcase full of manuscripts, 10 plays, and a large number of short stories, poems, and essays, rather than risk having them found by rampaging red guards and used as evidence against him. Yikes. Creative works became representations of a distorted reality. Gao speaks about Chinese artists breaking free from the socio-political shackles in the last two decades and how this brings an opportunity to embrace his notion of cold literature. However, he also speaks about the damage that is firmly in place from a century of being bound by political and ethical responsibilities and how an adherence to political correctness cultivated a distorted reality. 
In this lecture, I extend Gayle's definition of cold liter literature and how this theory of practice can be embraced and celebrated across three disciplines. I will examine the relationship between virtuosity, authenticity, and accessibility in the arts, beginning with a con and constantly returning to this notion coined by Gayle as cold literature. We will look at Gayle's ideology transformed from cold literature to cold dance, cold theater, cold photography, and cold painting, exemplifying the difference between provocative, that was back here, and palatable art. The selection artists for this survey are Canadian artist Jean-Pierre Perrault, James McNeil, Francis Bacon, Edward Moybridge, and Robert Longo, and the works of River Dance. For those of you who like River Dance, you'll see a clip from the internet. I am curious as to whether this definition of Gale's cold literature, so geographically and histor historically situated, can transcend this specificity to address the tensions artists feel in regards to cultivating and preserving authenticity of voice and integrity of intentions in the face of emotional and practical demands for survival. Gale writes of cold literature as literature that refuses to be strangled by society in its quest for spiritual salvation. Sitting in the splash zone. Gale's work in theater pushed against what was and is known as the Stanislavskian method, crashing the fourth wall that preserves the safe delineation and therefore emotional distance of the audience. This was constructed with the good intention of creating a contained focus for the actors, which Stanislavski called the closed creative circle. This circle constructs the impenetrable kinosphere of the actors, guaranteeing physical and visceral distance from the audience. Gail worked hard to de deconstruct this closed cell where performance took place, disrupting the historical patterns of theater as he knew it. Gail was inspired by the works of Bertolt Brecht, whose work was first exposed to China in 1959 with the piece Mother Courage and Her Children. As the fourth wall was pulled down by Brecht, Gao stepped forward and on it with the intention to fuse traditional Chinese theater techniques with a contemporary vernacular. By introducing a formal and emotional engagement with the actors, he moved the emphasis from character development to authenticity, presence, and action. This was thought to be a method towards establishing the character as opposed to constructing the character. He did this by dividing the character into three components, self, neutral actor, and the character. And through this triangle of focus, he created an impartial subjective distance, which he believed was necessary to bring a heightened awareness of audience and a cultivated astuteness to the playing space. And here's a quote. By embodying the three identities on the stage, the actor can challenge the character he is playing, empathize with him, pity, admire, and even criticize with him. The dramatic tension resulting from this kind of act acting is beyond that produced by mere yelling and shouting, which dis disguises themselves as theater. In this way, not only the plot, but also acting itself can be interesting and becomes the focus of the audience's attention. This is not unlike Beckett's Waiting for Godot. The plot line and locations are considered secondary to the motive of waiting, or the motif of waiting. With this shift in the character focus, Gale was creating a disruption in the historical, socio-political discourse of Chinese theater, and as a result was not always accessible or well-received as he deconstructed the positive portrayal of the her heroic proletarian figures. By this, Gale re revealed and exposed the real relations of power that lay beneath the patina of appearance to show his audience the true nature of society thereby empowering them to change it. 
Gale moves the esteem and distinction of the sole creator, the brilliant actor, to a leveled ground by dismantling the edifice from which we judge a successful work of art. Later in this lecture, we'll, we'll consider current Canadian methods for judging successful art. He invites us into a participatory <laughs> arena, and that's a really important word that threads through this lecture, participatory arena, whereby creative impulse alone fuels meaning and impact. This is what I call reading a performance, and we'll do more of that. Shifting audience, spectator, from a passive position to a participatory location. For example, I will read the straight stage directions for the play Other Shore by Gale. The play can be performed in a theater, a living room, a rehearsal room, an empty warehouse, a gymnasium, the hall or a temple, a circus tent or an empty space, as long as the necessary lighting and sound equipment can be properly installed. Lighting can be dispensed with the play performed during the day. The actors may be among the audience and the audience among the actors. The two situations are the same and will not make any difference during the play. So in other words, the complacency of a complete work in a safe viewing distance has been blasted into another location, a fusion of audience and spectator, whereby the performance becomes a dynamic living ecosystem, whereby meanings are created and recreated moment by moment from both sides. This is you sitting in the splash zone. This is not an easy space for audience members or performers and involves a certain degree of risk. My work as a dancer choreographer for the last 30 years has always embraced the authenticity and the lives in, that lives inside of risk. Often I would build this state into my dances. For example, in one dance I asked the dancers in my company, Ricketts Dance Co., to first have their heads shaved on stage as the audience was arriving and then move through the choreographed adagio, balancing small china teacups on their heads. You didn't know I was this weird, did you, Ross? She's like, oh my God, what did I get into? <laughs> the program stated if the cups should fall, the performance would be suspended for a moment while the shards of porcelain were swept away from their bare feet. Another example entailed covering the stage with sandbags, creating a state of emergency in the dancer's playing field, both with associative images as well as the dancer's reality, holding balance on one leg with an unpredictable shifting in the foundations creates the necessary tension in the dancer's reality, thus integrating the concept of inherent tension. In this way, a dynamic performing environment has been created whereby the dancers in discovery as well as the audience. Whereby the dancers are in discovery as well as the audience. The props, sandbags and teacups and actions, balanced and sustained movement, created a necessary tension with the dancer that was transmitted to the audience, cultivating immediacy, an emergency, and most importantly, an astuteness an astuteness where transformation can occur. My stage managers were constantly reprimanding me, next time can you consider not using real sand, not using real porcelain, or in the case of another piece, couldn't you not have one of your dancers play the role of a blind man in that particular part? My answer only fueled their constant exasperation, the tension that lives inside of crisis and the risk that is entailed in holding and navigating that tension is what produces the vitality that actually fuels the work and further to this, the authenticity of that work. These pieces were not choreographed, but I call the, that they were housed with improvisational elements through unpredictability of the props. Now my pieces have become entirely unpredictable with the exception of knowing perhaps a prop I will use and the location of the performance. In my examples of teacups and sandbags, there was a notion of bringing authenticity to the construct of the stage. What I loved about this is the audience's engagement. They stopped unwrapping the lifesavers. They stopped coughing for fear of coughing. They stopped rattling the programs and indeed for even a moment stopped breathing. There's a genuine impulse to engage on an immediate and yet deep level. 
These are the openings in the performance. These are the ruptures in our, our often passive relationships of spectator-performer. And this is what I'm currently the most interested in with my continued explorations of space and witness in performance. Did you get it? Get what? How many times have you gone to a performance and you come out with another friend and you say, did you get it? Get what? So my, uh, my proposal is you get rid of that. <laughs> you get rid of the question, did you get it? And you move into how did you read that? What did you see? What was important to you? So here's a small poem that addresses that. Interruptions to that which is known with the help of a tomato. How to eat a poem. Don't be polite, bite in. Pick it up with your fingers and lick the juice that may run down your chin. It's ready and ripe now whenever you are. You do not need a knife or fork or spoon or plate or napkin or tablecloth. For there is no core or stem or rind or pit, or seed, or skin to throw away. How are you guys doing out there? Is everyone okay? <laughs> you don't need a stretch or anything? We're coming up to river dance. <laughs> Ceylant writes about performance artist Laurie Anderson. I don't know if people here know Laurie Anderson. She works with uh, technology and spoken word and performance. Um, it speaks about performance artist Lorianne, Larry Anderson as someone who dismantles the conventions of performer-spectator relationship by constructing what she, he calls a passage. All of Laurie Anderson's work is directed toward attempting to divine the principles of another performativeness, where the stage is not a threshold that cannot be crossed, but rather a passage, an access to a dialogue between the vital core of life and the audience as a whole. Every event, music or visual, is for her an open, transparent instrument, not only bound to her identity, but ready to dissolve, to give way to a powerful current of real energy. She thus keeps a distance from the visual orientation of self and narcissistic self-gratification and favors instead the eruption of a hidden condition of being. This brings Anderson in her relationship with the theatricality to conceive the stage space as a participatory parameter in which the profound reality of life offers itself to perception and to the gaze of all. What does the viewer bring to a performance? How do they ignite meaning? And what is the connective tissue between what is perceived and what is transmitted? Cold dance. In teaching a series of university courses in critical analysis of performance, I never fail to present an excerpt of Joe back to back with an excerpt from the finale in River Dance. The reason for this exercise is to identify the difference between popular art and what Gale might term cold dance, and how this theory could relate to all disciplines in the field of performing and visual arts. With the river dance excerpt, there is an immediate and strong connection to the clean, smiling faces, tight dresses, long, organized hair. We instantly understand the homogenized look and indicate our appreciation of the virtuosity which is inargub inarguably displayed. All right, here's our next. Uh, um, little challenge, let me see if I can do this.
Well, there you go. That was Riverdance. Let me take a look at what you all look like out there. Yes. Big smiles. Um, now, I don't need to say how big the audience capacity would be for a show like this, right? Um, and I'm going to show you now, in a second, excerpts from Joe by Jean-Pierre Perrault, and you could probably guess that the house capacity would be maybe one quarter. Where are my glasses? <laughs> don't do a PhD, it'll wreck your eyes, I think. Okay, so I'm going to go back and read that little uh, thing that I had read just before there. With the river dance excerpt, there is an immediate and strong connection to the clean, smiling faces, tight dresses, long, organized hair. We instantly understand the homogenized look and indicate our appreciation of the virtuosity which is inarguably displayed. Am I right? Yes. This is work which is codified and actually set up to get. We get it. Earlier, I mentioned the notion of palatable, palatable versus pr provocative. There is at once an affirmation of our own cognitive and perceptual abilities. Note the photo <laughs> shows all dancers airborne and their feet equal distant from the ground. All right, now we're going to move to Joe. The work of the late Jean-Pierre Perrault's Joe was a seminal modern dance piece many years ago. In the making, involved 32 dancers in oversized overcoats who move in and out of the rhythmic and imagistic depictions of the survivalist's story within the destructive forces of conformity. Okay, now wish me luck here. i got to... So I'm going to show you just a few excerpts. We'll start with right at the very beginning. Um. Was that too loud? Yeah. Sorry. I'm going to stop there for a second just to talk, and then I'll show you a few more excerpts. So I chose, um, in, in my examples now of cold dance, cold photography, and cold painting, I'm intentionally choosing um, works that somehow look uh, have some similarities. So I chose that piece because of the lineups and the rhythm, and, um, but you can see a very distinctive difference. Joe was hailed as an international masterpiece, illuminating the identical tension in Gayo's work as well as his self-reflections in regards to identity, authenticity, and how this relates to membership in the human club. The students see this work, and the looks are less appreciative. 
The costumes are not complimentary, although the rhythm heard through the big boots on the amplified floor is synchronized. There is a slight difference in the shapes of some of the dancers, and the picture is punctuated with erratic impulses of single or clustered dancers working against the steady rhythm of the boots. Although there are fewer smiles and less simpatico body movements, the dialogue provoked by this piece is lengthy, engaged, and rich with images, memories, and emotions. So we'll look at another one, and then I'm just going to ask you what you see in there. Okay, so I gave you a bunch of different images there, and I just want to throw it out there to say what kinds of words or pictures or images or feelings or anything came from that. Yeah? Conformity. Conformity, okay. Militaristic. Militaristic. Suspense. Suspense.
Okay, nice. Male. Male, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think there probably are women dressed as men in yep. this group, and I found that the river dance is predictable. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something? Okay. Yeah. I don't see how you can call something like this cold dance because this is really hot. I mean, we're all saying these words that are not cold and dispassion. Yeah. I would call the other one tepid, and this is hot. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. No, I, you bring up, and I, and I write about this a little bit later, but um, it is ironic that Gao Shijang um, coined what he's talking about as cold literature is actually. Um, it's a funny term because he's actually talking about literature that has a very strong individual voice. And, and I think when he talks about cold, it's because he felt that he had to go into isolation to be able to um, be heard with that individual voice. So that's why I called this talk Cold Art, Warm Heart, because I really do believe that there is a heat in this, this idea of what he has termed cold literature. So I'm glad you bring it up because it is, there is a tension there with that. Yeah. We'll, we'll stay with the warm heart. Yeah. <laughs> That's for Roz. It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine. Yeah. And also another characteristic I would say is not the individual uh, who is trying to seek out his own path, got resistance and being lost, you know, in the, the So if I said just call out a, a place, wherever this was provoked, a place idea or place memory, what would people say? There's no right answer. <clears throat> say it again. Warehouse. Warehouse. Wall City. Wall Street, <laughs> city. Factory. Like a tribal dance. Like a tribal? A tribal. Yeah. Okay. Nazi Germany. Okay, Nazi Germany. An occupied site. An occupied site. So right now what we're doing is we're creating this kind of porousness, this in-out, this kind of nice dialogue where I hear differences. And I hear that that's okay, right? It's Nazi Germany, it's a warehouse, it's, it's a tribe, it's uh, everydayness. And all of those are right answers. And that's what I'm trying to cultivate in this idea of a participatory place for audience to be able to come away from something and say, do you know what I saw? And not to worry about, I'm not sure if I got it, but this is what I saw. What I want to do is get rid of that that sentence that was before it, that qualifier. Great, good work, audience. <laughs> We're coming up to an interactive part. Um, okay, so we've seen fewer smiles. Okay, rich memories. And the identification of the work moves through the students and they come to appreciate the work on a deeper level than a connoisseurship of the virtuosic. Perot's work plays with this method of creating theater dance through a process I define as bricolage technique, building images through a collage-like system. This is similar to Gayo's work, and the results are described by a critic of Gayo's work, Labaditska. He says, Sometimes the literary text drives merely as a springboard for an autonomous theatrical work in which the logic of the plot, the principle of cause and effect, and the concept of characters are virtually undetectable. In Gao Shijang's theater, metamorphoses of space are accompanied by transformations of time. A moment can grow into infinity, and infinity can shrink into a moment. Time may contract and expand, slow down or accelerate, or move in circles or spiral, instead of developing along a straight line. 
With this examination of Joe, I'm reinforcing one of the key factors in cold literature, which is to free the creative work from a dominated interpretive framework and to invite an individual reading and thereby activate an interpretive agency in the viewer. River dance, representing the brilliance of the common denominator in dance appreciation, begins to fade in this light, despite the vitality of its pure technical prowess and downright sexiness. The interpretation of this work is inarguably short-lived in our imaginations. So I'm not going to read the next part. I'm going to do it for you. It's called Body Glossary. And it's an exercise that I do to build um, this notion of interpretation. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you the difference between codified and provocative movement. Okay, so codified mu- movement, we all know this. So here I go. Um, Good. There we go. Excellent. Give yourselves a hand. That was what? uh, 19 seconds, hey? Very, very good. So school teachers get that right away because they're like, they have that in their classes. And I was thinking, what should I give you guys? But you were good with Catcher in the Rye. Great. All right. Here comes another one. What do you see? Star. Windmills. Swimming in the moonlight. Swimming in the moonlight. Shooting. Shooting? Shooting Shooting stars. Sunrise. Sunrise. Yay, I won. If I get five answers that are not what I had thought in my head, then I win. So what I'm creating is the same as Jean-Pierre Perrault. I'm creating uh, an image with my body that you feel very confident reading, and they're all different answers, and they were all different than mine, and we all feel satisfied. (laughs) So my word was crest, crest of an arc. Now, how would you have ever got that? But I was very clear in myself, so I gave you such a clear intention that you felt comfortable saying Sunrise, dancing in the moonlight. That's how I would love it if you could go to performances and that you felt confident in reading the way you saw it. So think about that difference between codified and provocative or evocative. That's a really important part of reading performances. So I don't have to read that part now. All right, so... I apply this contextual, which is what I call this contextual looking, to both my performing and my teaching. And in this way, I do not lose the structure or skeleton of form or the intentions that live within it, but rather allow this availability to the moments that may influence this form. And most importantly, the unexpected readings that inevitably flow within the gesture. What is the true image here? We keep coming back to the notion of getting it. John Berger explores this notion of capturing truth through the photographic lens from another way of telling. Berger speaks of truth and the camera as a tool of capture. He writes the camera quotes instead of translates, as it has no language of its own. The photographic quotation is within its limits incontrovertible, yet the quotation placed like a fact in an explicit argument can misinform. He goes on to say, at one level, there are no photographs which can be denied. All photographs have the status of fact. What has to be examined is in what way photography can and cannot give meaning to facts. There's a few pictures of Joe. That was body glossary, codified language, evocative language. Cold photography. Photographer Edward Moybridge, photo series from 1880, began with the objective to reveal what is hidden from our natural eyes, to use the lens as a way of dissecting the body in motion with a rigorous, systematic process. Despite Moybridge's rigor in process, working with absolute precision within a time frame of one one one-hundredth of a second, the results were more than austere or clinical. Moybridge's work 
incremental captures of human movement explored the range of gender, age, ability, and race with the primary goal to reveal what is hidden from our natural eyes, the truth of the human in motion. Moybridge stated that he wanted to see the world from the perspective of a bullet's trajectory. We probably all know that Moybridge was working, the reason he started this was he was trying to win an argument to see if there was a place when all four hooves were off the ground. And this was the forerunner of film, this work that he was doing. <clears throat> this Moybridge considered to be the, reveal, the revealing of truths in human motion, which nature otherwise conceals. This obsession with finding the truth that lies within the outer core was not just present with Moybridge. An entire movement that came with the aspects of developing technology, photography being one of these aspects, microscopy and x-rays being another. This triggered a new movement towards having access to the inner body. Kemp and Wallace say these developments in art and medical imagining occurred over the same time span is not coincidental. The kinds of truths for which artists and medical researchers were mutually searching lay not just within and under the surface of appearance of things as they had for generating, but at different levels of reality, more abstract and often ever more minute. This idea of seeing through a movement harkens back to those who were known as the anatomically minded draftsmen, exemplifying the notion of seeing through the form to the internal world. Alberti's On Painting from 143 AD writes, first sketch in the bones, for as they bend very little indeed, they always occupy a determined position. Then add the sinews and muscle, and finally clothe the bones and the muscles with flesh and skin. It was also believed to be a key factor in the revolution of naturalistic renderings from the Renaissance to be rigorous in the mastery of the body as a functioning system of motion and emotion. We finally move to Leonardo da Vinci who, when speaking of the Last Supper, says, it was necessary to understand at the deepest level the inner causes of outer effects, to recreate the configurations adopted by the bodies and faces of the protagonists it was necessary to track the ebb and flow of the sensation and emotion to the innermost impulses of the characters in dramatic situations. Anatomical artists of the first half of the 20th century were indeed able to recognize and value inner emotion and empathy as integral to their portrayals of the human figure. Maliev speaks of Moybridge's work as seeking to photograph the expressiveness of the body. Moybridge spoke of stripping the action in order to reveal the muscle and bone, and then attempting to strip away muscle and bone to reveal the music of the gesture. To reveal the music of the gesture. Although coming from an opposite startling point, the painters from the Renaissance intersected this concept at the point of explanations and codifications of the exterior manifestations of the inner sanctum. With Leonardo's coining of the intentions of the mind, there is a common thread of curiosity and even dedication to reveal the interconnectedness of the soul with the house it inhabits. Robert Longo is another photographer and visual artist who arrives at the same place of imaginative sympathy. Contrary to Moybridge, Longo builds the image of the eroticism and urgency and the heat within crisis, not so different than the possibility of the crashing teacup but conducts his photograph, photographic sessions with the same accuracy, capturing the microsecond of a moment. He is best known for his deconstruction of the representational narrative within the work of the twisting and undulating figures of men in the cities. This is a series of pencil etchings from photographs from 1981 where Longo dresses his subjects in what critic Richard Price calls drop-dead chicness, chic who are in danger of literally dropping dead. He then proceeds to throw tennis balls at them, recording their instinctive reactions, which are described by Price as dancing, dying, dancing, dying. Price speaks of the fate of these severely chic Manhattan figures as vacuous shells awaiting our signifiers. Longo's art isolates us in the act of projecting significance into the void of many voids. These images, these misplaced dramas, are, as Douglas Crimp claims, freed from the tyranny of the represented. 
freed from the tyranny of the represented. I love, I love that. Throughout my dance life, I have encountered those who suffer from the tyranny of representation as they timidly back away from telling me what they saw, what they felt when witnessing a performance. This is the fear of not getting it. Longo's figures are in fact falling under the weight of a hollow mass culture of inauthentic values. He claims these figures can be granted fictive individuality. We, as the viewer, have agency to name the meaning of his humans in motion. Alberti's theory on representing the body previously states, start with the bones and close the figure. Moybridge says, strip down the muscle and bone to the music of the gesture. Longo says, if I took the clothes off the people in my drawings, all I would get would be white paper. These figures exist in an empty vortex, forcing or intuiting the viewer to complete the image. Ratcliffe speaks of this as a yearning and further claims that this is what Longo's work is hinged upon. He states that these figures are in a kind of violent deathfall and are actually quite empty. It is the viewer that creates the violence. It's not a picture of someone being shot, Longo reminds us, the person being shot every time you look at it. You know who the guy is shooting the person. It's you. It's the viewer, asserts Longo, who pulls the trigger. When entering into a space of dialogue with students regarding a reading of a short story or a performance, I want them to feel this power. Longo's interests lies not exclusively with human forms and urgent, immediate, instinctive response. He's also interested in something much more. With this work, Longo invites us to engage from an authentic and very present location. This, I propose, places primacy on an authenticity of spirit, echoed both in Moybridge and Longo, which are key principles in engaging interests from the viewer. In a case for literature, Gayo supports this by stating his interest is in something much deeper, which is triggered through crisis. He says... Literature is not simply a replica of reality. It penetrates the surface layers and reaches deep into the inner working of reality. It removes false illusion, looks down from great heights at ordinary happenings, and with a broad perspective, reveals these happenings in their entirety. He goes on to explain that imagination is integral in this theory, but not without being linked to authenticity of emotional spirit. Without this, an audience has absolutely no chance of being moved. And our last one is cold painting, and this is where you're going to do your little interactive thing with your neighbor. The immediacy that Longo's Man in the City series is hinged upon can be linked to the works of Francis Bacon, whose painting technique he himself refers to as accidental. The accident occurs in his paintings when he moves involuntary marks upon the canvas. His interest then finds in these marks a way of developing the image. A developed image, Bacon claims, is one that is both factual and suggestive to the nervous system. Isn't it that one wants a thing to be as factual as possible and yet at the same time is deeply suggestive or deeply unlocking of areas of sensation? other than simple illustrating of the object that you set out to do. Isn't that what art is all about? According to Bacon himself, the distortions undergone by face or body are the consequence of his searching for a way to make the paint come across directly to the nervous system. He refers to the nervous system of painter and spectator, a system independent of the brain. He furthers that the kind of figurative painting which appeals to the brain is just illustrational and boring. A similar exercise is with Perrault in River Dance, Moybridge in Longo. I placed Whistler's mother side by side with Bacon's study after Valasquez's portrait of Pope, Innocent X. I hope I said that right. Whistler's Mother is a piece that belongs to the club of the very esteemed classes. The Mona Lisa, American Gothic, the Blue Boy are certainly not dismissible pieces in their own right, but iconicized to the point of public accessibility that they have become the masterpieces in a board game akin to Monopoly. Whistler's Mother is part of this sheen of acknowledgement and validation. In comparing the two paintings, we refer to a canon of painting in order to safely acknowledge and appreciate the work confident that within this endeavor we are guaranteed to be within a critical mass, a member of the club of generalized interpretive frameworks. 
but would our engagement with the work and the resonating meeting be deeper with Bacon's study? I suspect that Gail would insist that Bacon's work would qualify for the def definition of cold painting and provoke authentic engagement with its viewer. And Whistler's mother would remain a respected masterpiece within a historicized dominant value system. So, get your paper ready. <laughs> And I'm going to do the first little demo here. Okay. It's my last piece of technology. So far, so good. So I only have two colors, but that's okay. So what did I call that? I called that codified and evocative, right? This was my favorite picture when I was a little kid. Yeah, the chimney, the flowers, everybody knows this image, right? What else? The windows, the doors, okay, there we go. Does everybody know what this image is? <laughs> it is the house, the flowers, the street. Okay, now I'm going to blindfold myself. Let's take this off. Okay, sorry for not having paint. <laughs> what do you see? Face. A face. <laughs> Say it loud. Anger in the ocean. Anchor in the ocean. I liked anger in the ocean too. <laughs> There's Bacon's mistakes. I like that. An arrow. An arrow. A snowman. A snowman. It's Picasso esque. An owl. An owl. Okay, so you get the point. <laughs> um, so we can we could start discussions and and lengthy discussions on how we go in and read an image, and our discussion was pretty short lived here with this one, other than that we all know that we did that probably when we were a kid. So that would maybe bring up some things about us being a kid. But here's the image that would start a half hour discussion if we wanted to. So that's, again, we're talking about uh, codified and evocative. You guys are just doing great. We are almost at the very end here, and then I'll take any questions there could be. This, uh, this dominant system is key when examining the isolation and loneliness that pervades Gayo's work, both in his fiction and in his lectures. As Gayo notes, I estranged myself from life, and so I betrayed the truth of life, for the truth of life is not equivalent to the outer manifestation of life. And when drawing this comparison to contemporary artists such as myself, I witness and experience this dominant discourse of art, appreciation, and validation, forcing a kind of ghettoization for the work that challenged the canon of innovative accessibility. The artists creating cold theater, cold painting, cold dance are sometimes marginalized with the super funding structures such as the Canada Council for the Arts. Canada Council's mandate is to foster and promote the study and enjoyment of the arts and the production of the works of art. It goes on to claim its aims. 
The council aims to support artist, artistic excellence, therefore it must ensure through its management systems and practice that it awards financial support to the most deserving artists and arts organizations, and that it does so in the fair, consistent, and objective manner. It does this by two systems. The tenets governing the allocation of funds, which in many cases is the livelihood of the artist, is one, arm's length, defining its relationship to the government, and two, peer assessment, which ensures the connection to the artist's community. Both systems have criteria measured in percentages on a comparative scale, examining both the merit and the dissemination of the applicant's work. Now I'll remind you that River Dance and the size of its performance venue opposed to Joe. As states on the website, the system is suffocated by an incestuous dominant discourse of placing its stamp of excellence on work that is struggling for innovation and accessibility, which necessitates experimentation. This results in a dog chasing its own tail. Financial support is not granted without proof of other financial partners, which is directly consequential to successful statistics, i.e. ticket sales. All right, so now I'm just going to um, shuffle through these papers because I can just see that, there, I was missing my last page. An audience becomes the connective tissue to a performance. This is vital in allowing the individual voice of the performer to speak and to be heard. Hearing that voice is a matter of shifting our role as spectator. I would like to reiterate that a performance success lies in the power of interpretation. The reading of the event of performance takes performers and audience out of a space of complacency and into a space of participation. Imaginative sympathies, contextual looking gives power to both the audience and the performer in knowing that a third space of meaning making can and should be provoked by every performance event. Thank you. Thank you.